Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 13 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is Data Mining Methods for High Dimensional Data Principal Component Analysis. Now, in many data mining applications, we get high dimensional data. For example, in Bioinformatics gene expression data is very high dimensional in financial market or in stock market we get high dimensional data. Then remote sensing data is also very high dimensional. Often it happens that although the data is high dimensional, but it is concentrated around a low dimensional feature the space. Then the issue is that is it possible to reduce the dimension of the data and keep the information provided by the data also. Means you want to retain the information in the data and you also want to reduce the dimension of the data or you may compromise with some part of information say 10 percent, 50 percent. But if you can provide a much reduction in the dimension of the data then it is worth going. Now, principal component analysis provides you a tool for reducing the dimension of the data. So, in this lecture we are going to discuss some basics of principal component analysis. Principal component analysis linear dimensionality reduction. Now, most of the classical statistical methods are set up for use on low dimensional data and usually the number of observations is taken as much larger than the number of features. For instance, usually in fitting a multiple linear regression model say y equal to x beta plus u suppose n is the number of observations and r is the number of variables involved then we take n to be larger than r. Low dimension data were common in the past when data collection was more difficult and time consuming. But in many areas or in many applications of science, we get high dimensional data set not only in science, but in other fields also say financial data or many other fields. Now, collecting observations is usually more expensive than collecting many features from a single observation. So, once you have taken a single individual, then you can ask different questions from that individual if he agrees. So, you can collect information on many features or data on many features and it is easier than convincing a new individual for giving data. Then observations on large number of features lead to high dimensional data. So, if you have a very large number of features and you are taking observations 
on all the features, then you get high dimensional data. And in practice often you have more dimensions than the number of observations. Now, these data are becoming more common in biological sciences and other fields due to increases in data storage capabilities and computing, computing power. So, with the advancement in computers, it become possible for you to store very high size of data or big data. Data storage capability is increasing very fast. Then computation power of the computers is also increasing very fast, exponentially actually. So, it is possible for you to store big data, the data having very high dimension as well as a large number of observations. And it is also possible for you to analyze such kind of data. Now, here are some examples of high dimensional data. The first example is genomic data. Often the DNA sequencing data has a thousands of millions of genetic markers observations on a very large number of genetic markers and usually the number of genetic markers on which you are collecting data is much, much larger than the number of cases which you consider. So, it is high dimensional data. Number of variables is usually much larger than the number of observations or the number of cases. Then image data you have high resolution images with a very large say millions of pixels and observations on a particular pixel represent a particular variable. So, you have a very high number of a very large number, number of variables. Then text data text documents represented as high dimensional vectors. So, again the data has very high dimension, a very large number of variables. Omics data or multi omics data. Then you have measurements for say thousands of features in multi omics data. For example, thousands of genes or thousands of proteins etcetera across multiple samples. So, you have multiple samples and then you have a very large number of features also and again usually the number of features is larger than the number of samples. Financial data. You have data from multiple financial instruments over time. For example, stock market data. You have multiples of stocks. So, very large number of variables on which you take observations over time. So, the data is high dimensional. Sensor data, you take measurements from sensor networks and the number of sensor networks is usually very large. Biomedical image data, say you have medical imaging data with high spatial resolution say for example, MRI data or CT scan data. These data have very high spatial resolution. So, again you get 
a very large number of variables, observations on a very large number of variables, high dimensional data. Customer transaction data, say data from customer transactions and interactions. Say for example, in e-commerce, say there are millions of products. So, number of variables is very large or customer browsing behavior, it is also very high dimensional. Remote sensing data, say satellite images or remote sensing platforms data is usually very high dimensional. So, in many areas you get high dimensional data and uh, often the number of dimensions or number of variables is higher than the number of samples or the number of cases. Now, we come to the issue of dimensionality reduction. Uh, actually, if you have a very large number of features, a very large number of variables, the data set is very high dimensional, then it becomes difficult for you to visualize the data. For data visualization purpose, you require some sort of simpler representation. For example, in case of multiple regression, if you have a large number of explanatory variables or a large number of input variables, then it make it difficult to plot the response variable against each of the explanatory variables to identify which of these are important predictors of the response. Say suppose you have just two variables x and y, then you can easily plot the points in using a scatter plot and then you can visualize that the two variables are highly correlated and uh, it may be possible for you to fit a straight line to this data set. But if you have a very large number of explanatory variables or input variables, then such kind of plot is difficult and you would not be able to find the important predictors of the response on the basis of plot of response variables. It can be difficult to identify a single response variable making standard data exploration and analysis techniques less useful. So, you cannot identify a single important response variable and then uh, it would not be possible for you to apply standard data exploration and analysis techniques. Uh, now, one of the possibilities is you map the data to a lower dimensional space and this is called dimensionality reduction. It may be possible that your data set is very high dimensional, but it is concentrated around a much lower dimensional feature space. So, the issue is, is it possible to identify such a feature space around which your data set is concentrated? And if it is possible, then you can map the data to a lower dimensional space. And in such cases, you can reduce the dimension of the data without losing much information. And basic objectives of dimensionality reductions are you have you want to save computation or memory. Say suppose your data set is 100 dimensional and if somehow it becomes possible for you 
to represent the data in two dimension. Then saving 100 dimensional data or handling 100 dimensional data is much more difficult than saving 2 dimensional data or 3 dimensional data or handling 2, 3 dimensional data. So, it saves computation as well as memory and it reduces overfitting. For example, you have observed the problem of overfitting in multiple linear regression model and to overcome the problem of overfitting what we do? Either we use some sort of variable selection technique or you can use principal component regression etcetera. So, dimensionality reduction reduces overfitting also and then you can visualize the data in two dimensions provided it is possible for you to reduce the dimension of the data to two dimensions without losing much information. Now, we come to the principal component analysis. It is a dimensionality reduction technique. You want to reduce the dimension of the data and then for this purpose we use principal component analysis. And basically what we do in principal component analysis, it actually transforms a set of features into a smaller set of features. There is some sort of transformation. You have a large number of features and then you make certain transformation and reduce it into a smaller set of features and then we retain as much information as possible. So, without losing much information, you reduce the number of features. For the collection of correlated variables, a technique for deriving a reduced set of orthogonal linear projections ordered by decreasing variance. So, what we do? We, do, we use orthogonal linear projections. So, suppose the variables are highly correlated. Then we make use of reduced set of orthogonal linear projections. And this is how we reduce the dimension of the data. And the technique through which we obtain such kind of orthogonal linear projection and this orthogonal linear projections, these linear projections are ordered by decreasing variance means the first linear projection has maximum variance, the second one has second maximum variance and so on and all these linear projections are orthogonal to each other. So, this technique is called the principal component analysis. Now, variance is a measure of the amount of information in the variable. Say how much information observations on a variable have, this is measured by the variance. Larger the variance, more the information it has. It is also a method for decorrelating observations matrix X. You have this observation matrix, you make certain kind of linear transformation, then your transformed variables are uncorrelated with each other. So, you can say it is a method for decorrelating observations matrix X. Then using a linear transformation, it chooses a new coordinate system for the data set. 
such that the greatest variance by any projection of the data set comes to lie on the first axis or in some sense you can say that you have rotated the axis in such a way that the first axis has maximum variance, the greatest variance and this is your first principal component. Then the second greatest variance is on the second axis and so on. We can also use the principal component analysis for reducing dimensionality by eliminating the latter principal components. Uh, remember the first principal component has the maximum variance, so it has the maximum inf information. The second principal component has second greatest variance. So, the second principal component has second maximum information. Now, later principal components have a smaller variance. So, those principal components do not have much information contained in the original data. So, you can eliminate those principal components and this is the technique which we use in principal component analysis for reducing the dimensionality of the data. Say we make some kind of linear transformation or through that linear transformation we choose a new coordinate system for the data set such that the greatest variance by any projection of the data set comes to lie on the first axis. So, now your first axis of the transformed coordinate system is like that it has the maximum variance. So, this is the first principal component. Then your second axis which is of course, orthogonal to the first axis has the second greatest variance and so on and then you eliminate the latter principal components because those principal components do not have much information contained in the data and then it leads to reducing the dimensionality of the data. And then we will observe that PCA is a eigenvalue eigenvector problem. So, we will make use of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to employ principal component analysis. So, graphically uh, you can explain the principal component problem using this graph. It has uh, several features say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 features or uh, and then you want to reduce the number of features, you have reduced the number of features to say 3. So, this is your principal component problem, you want to reduce the number of features. Now, we consider this simple example. Say we consider these observations in three dimension. Your observations are 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, 3, 6, 9 and so on. For storing these observations you require 8 into 3 means you have 8 observations each observation is of three dimension. So, 24 bytes. Now, you can write these points in this form say 1 into 1, 2, 3, 2 into 1, 2, 3, 3 into 1, 2, 3, 4 into 1, 2, 3, 5 into 1, 2, 3 and so on 8 into 1, 2, 3. Now, the points 
can be stored using three three bytes one two three plus eight multipliers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So, in all you require 8 plus 3 equal to 11 bytes. If you store the original data directly, you require 24 bytes, but here you require just 11 bytes. Now, suppose x, y, z this denote the three coordinates of the points. Now, notice that all the points lie on a line. Although the original set of points is distributed in three dimensional space. This is the three dimensional space on which all these points lie, but all the points actually lie on a line that is one dimensional space and that line is x equal to 2 y equal to 3 z. The first point has x coordinate 1, y coordinate 2 and z coordinate 3. So, it, it is 1, 2, 3. The second point has x coordinate 2, y coordinate 4 and z coordinate 9 and so on. So, you can easily verify that all the points lie on one dimensional space. So, the points are concentrated around a one dimensional space. Although the points are actually in the three dimensional space, but concentrated around one dimensional space, which is a subspace of three dimensional space the original three dimensional space on which the points are distributed. Now, you can rotate the coordinate system. So, that in the new coordinate system, one of the axis is along the direction of the line 1 x equal to 2 y equal to 3 z. So, you rotate the axis. Then all the points have only one non zero coordinate and one needs to store the direction of the line, which is a 3 bytes image and the non zero coordinate for each of the points 8 bytes. Now, in practice how do we know that the data set can be compressed? Then first thing is you look at the correlation matrix. And uh, if the observations are highly correlated, then it can be used for data compression. So, suppose you have these observations on two dimensional space. So, this is the original axis, this is x axis, then you have y axis here. So, the points are distributed in two dimension. But if you look at the correlation coefficient between these two variables, then you will observe that the observations are highly correlated. Now, this uh, indicates that there is a possibility of dimension reduction. In fact, the points are in two dimensional space. But if you rotate the axis towards this direction, means this is the direction along which you observe maximum variability. 
then even in one dimension you are retaining most of the information. And then the second axis is this, which is orthogonal to the first axis. So, this is your original axis and then you have rotated it, so that the first axis is towards the maximum variance direction and the second axis which is orthogonal to the first axis is towards the second maximum variance direction. And suppose you want to reduce the dimension of the data, then you just consider one axis and projection of each point on one axis. So, projection of this point on this axis, projection of this point on this axis, projection of this point on this axis and so on. So, all these projections also have a lot of information about the data. Projection onto a subspace. Now, let V be a subspace of R n and x belongs to R n. And suppose x v belongs to V and this x v is the closest vector in V. So, this V is the subspace, this x is the vector and x v is the projection of x on v. Then x v is the closest vector x in v. The vector x v is called the orthogonal projection of x onto v and then x v orthogonal is equal to x minus x v, this vector. Uh, this x v orthogonal is orthogonal to vectors in v. So, if uh, v is a subspace of R n, and x is a vector belonging to R n. Then the orthogonal projection x v is the closest vector to x in v and the distance from x to x v is the norm of x v orthogonal. Then principal component analysis is used to extract the, inform the important information from a multivariate data and express it as a set of few new variables. Say so, you transform the original multivariate data using the principal component analysis, then you select the first few principal components which have most of the information contained in the data and then you discard the remaining principal components which do not have much information about the data. So, it is a technique for extracting inf important information from the multivariate data and express it as a set of few new variables with much lower dimension also. New variables correspond to a linear combination of the originals. So, these new variables are just linear combination of the original variables and usually the number of principal components is less than or equal to the number of original variables. At the most number of principal components is equal to 
the number of original variables. And if you take the number of principal components equal to the number of original variables, then obviously there is no dimension reduction and the principal components have as much information as the original variables. Then the information corresponds to the total variation in data set. The total variation in the data set represents the information contained in the data. And the main goal is to identify directions along which the variation in data is maximum. So, you rotate the axis and before that you identify the directions along which you have the maximum variation. The first maximum then you select the next direction which is orthogonal to the first direction and has second maximum variation and then you select the third direction which is orthogonal to first two directions and has third maximum variation and so on. Then PCA reduces the dimensionality of multivariate data to two or three principal components. Of course, you can take more principal component al components also. So, it depends upon your problem and how many principal components can extract uh, sufficient information from the data. But usually we take two or three principal components because you can easily visualize two or three principal components graphically. If you have just two principal components, then it is most convenient. You can easily plot the two dimensional data or at the most three principal components can be easily plotted with minimum loss of information. The loss of information should be minimal. So, here we have taken the data set, then the red, blue and green directions are the first three principal components respectively. So, the data set is in three dimension. This direction has the maximum variation, then this is second maximum and green one is the third maximum. Now, we consider some uses of principal component analysis. There are many applications, some of the applications are you want to compress data to be transmitted without losing much information. Say, so, suppose you are transmitting the data then uh, sometimes it becomes difficult for you to transmit very high dimensional data uh, because uh, transmitting high dimensional data requires a lot of efforts, a lot of memory etcetera. So, you want to compress the data for transmission purpose and for compressing the data you can use principal component analysis. Pattern recognition, what kind of pattern the data follow, whether the data, the high dimensional data are concentrated around some lower dimensional space or not. And if yes, then uh, you want to identify that lower dimensional space. Uh, it is also used for image analysis. Then the first few principal component scores reveal whether most of the data actually live on a linear subspace of R and can be used to identify outliers, distributional peculiarities and clusters of points. So, you can use principal component analysis for identifying outliers also or the for obtaining clusters of points etcetera. And if you look at first few principal components 
and their scores. Then you can also identify whether most of the data actually concentrated around a lower dimensional subspace of RR or not. So, suppose you have a small R dimensional data and then just by looking at first few components, you can check or you can see whether the data is actually concentrated around a lower dimensional subspace. Then last few principal component scores can be used to detect collinearity. Now, this is what we do in the problem of multi collinearity in the context of multiple linear regression models also. To identify the multi collinearity problem, we make use of the last few principal components scores or last few eigenvalues, the smaller eigenvalues. Now, suppose x is equal to x 1, x 2, x r transpose. So, x is r cross 1 vector, it is a random set of r unordered and correlated input variables. These are input variables and these input variables are correlated. And psi which is equal to psi 1, psi 2, so on psi t, this is a set that t is less than or equal to r. This is a set of ordered and uncorrelated linear projections of x. So, you can write each component of psi as a linear combination of input variables. So, psi j is equal to b j 1 x 1 plus 1 plus b j r x r and then in using vector notations you can write it as b j transpose x for j equal to 1 to t. Well, this b j is the j th coefficients vector. So, b j is actually equal to b j 1, b j 2, so on b j r transpose. So, this is r cross 1 coefficients vector. These are linear projections and in principal component analysis what we do? It seeks to replace x by psi. You want to replace this r dimensional data by set of t linear projections of x and t is less than or equal to r, where we minimize the loss of information due to replacement. Naturally, when you replace all random set of input variables x 1, x 2, x r by t linear projections, where t is less than r then obviously, you are going to lose some information, but you want to minimize the loss of information or you can say that you want to choose this coefficients vector in such a way that the loss of information is minimum. Now, suppose expectation of x is mu x. So, this is the mean vector and expectation of x minus mu x, x minus mu x transpose is equal to sigma x x. So, sigma x x is the dispersion matrix of x. Now, in principal component analysis, information is equal to total variation of input variables. We just consider the total variation of input variables and that total variation of input variables gives you the total information contained in the data, contained in the input variables. 
Uh, now, before moving further, let us take an example. This is this data set. The data set has 150 observations on sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width of three flowers and the three flowers are Santosa, Versicolor and Virginica. This data set is uh, available in our software. So, you can easily use this data set which is uh, consist of 150 observations on these four variables for three flowers. So, first five observations I have displayed here. So, each observation has sepal length, sepal width, petal length and petal width. And uh, in the last column, the corresponding species are given. Now, we apply principal component analysis to this data set and uh, let us see what this principal component analysis does. Now, these are the standard deviations for first four principal components and uh, then we get these rotations. So, the first principal component is 0 0.521065 into sepal length minus 0 0.2693474 into sepal width and so on. So, these are the Bj's for the princ first principal components. Actually, you want to obtain these coefficients to get psi g's. So, these are the coefficients corresponding to the first principal component. These are the coefficients corresponding to the second principal component. Then we have the coefficients corresponding to the third principal component and the fourth principal component. Now, importance of different components. If we consider the standard deviation, the standard deviation corresponding to the first principal component is 1.7084, the second principal component is 0 0.9560, then for third principal component it is 0 0.38309 and for fourth principal component it is 0 0.14393. Now, we consider the proportion of variance which has been explained by different principal components. For different principal components, the variances are say for first principal component it is 0 0.7296, the maximum variance. The second principal component has 0 0.2285 variance. This is for the third principal component which is quite a small 0 0.03669. And this is for the fourth principal component. Then cumulative proportion is for the first principal component is it is 0 0.7296. Now, if you consider both the first and second principal component, you are able to explain 0 0.9581 or you can say around 95.8 percent variation present in the data. So, the original data is four dimensional, but if you consider just the first principal component, you are able to explain around 73 percent of the variation on the basis of first principal component. And on the basis of, of first two principal components, you are able to explain around 96 percent variation present in the data. So, the dimension of the data is reduced by 50 percent 
but loss of information is very small just 4 percent. Now, this is B PCA by plot. You have data in 4 dimension, but just you are taking uh, you, or you are plotting the data in 2 dimension using the first 2 principal components. So, this is dimension 1 and this is dimension 2. Dimension 1 is able to explain 73 percent variation around 73 percent variation present in the data. Whereas, dimension 2 is able to explain around 22.9 percent variation in the data. And here the different points are also plotted and uh, Santosa is represented by this red dot, Versi color is represented by green triangle and Zinica is represented by blue squares. So, this is how principal component analysis helps in reducing the dimension of the data. In many fields, we encounter with very high dimensional data and often it happens that the data is concentrated around a much lower dimensional feature space. Now, since it is difficult to handle the data in high dimension, you may be interested in reducing the dimension of the data in particular when the data is concentrated around the lower dimensional feature space. And while doing this, you also want to keep as much information as possible contained in the data. So, you do not want to reduce much information and for that purpose we use the tool principal component analysis. It is actually the simple uh, rotation of axis so that the first axis is in the direction of maximum variation, second axis is in the direction of second maximum variation and so on. In the next uh, couple of lectures, we will discuss principal component analysis in more details. Thank you. A. K. Sharma and I teach sociology at IIT Kanpur. I am going to address the question, what is the relevance of statistics in sociology? In India, there is some confusion about role of statistics in sociology and most of the students of sociology suffer from what I call phobia of statistics, but actually if you look at history of sociology or the kind of works that are being done in sociology which are published in prestigious academic journals, you find that there is lot of use of statistical methods and not simple methods, very advanced methods. All of you know as students of sociology, uh, you know that uh, one of the founding fathers of sociology, Comte or another founding father, Emile Durkheim. You know, they said that sociology is one subject which differs from other subjects uh, in the questions that they try to answer, but they use the same method, the method of science. And that in sociology, uh, those who believe in this kind of approach, they are called positivists, Emile Durkheim called them positivists. Uh, 
they, uh, they believe that uh, social issues must be studied by using observations, experiments and other modes of collection of data. Now, statistics can help sociologists in three ways. Because if sociology is about social facts or patterns, not individuals, patterns, patterns of thinking, patterns of feeling, patterns of acting, behaving and they can be measured, they can be quantified and that explanation of one social fact can be given only in terms of other facts. We need statistics because statistics can measure these facts statistics can describe these facts. So, one branch of statistics we can call it descriptive statistics can help us in summarizing data, in measuring facts like you are all familiar with simple statistical things like mean, mode, median or methods of dispersion, standard deviation, range, variance, these are descriptive measures. They can also be used to measure skewness or symmetry or asymmetry in the data. Other types of statistical methods which are called inferential statistics are used to test hypothesis. We know that uh, any science including sociology if we follow that positivistic tradition is about testing hypothesis using scientific methods and for testing hypothesis like for comparative purposes, comparing means of two samples or comparing variances of two samples or comparing correlation coefficients or regression coefficients, we need inferential statistics. And if you are familiar with some of them, t test, z test, chi square test, f test, these are the tests which come under inferential statistics. We use statistics for drawing inferences uh, about two or more samples. And thirdly, statistics can also be used for posing new questions. I remember that uh, a few months ago, I read an article in Population and Development Review in which uh, the authors uh, Cole and Gramajo they tried to explain homicide rates and variations in homicide rates across uh, countries in the entire world. And they found based on statistical analysis, logistic regression and all, they found that one factor which explains variations in homicide rates in the world is female education not culture, not governance so much, not even male education, but female education. Now, if facts are showing this, so you have a new sociological question, why is it that rise in female education leads to higher homicide rates? And Cole and Gramajo then gave certain hypotheses, you may not agree with those hypotheses, uh, you may conduct this study on your own uh, or test these hypotheses given by Cole and Gramajo using statistical methods. But the point I am making that in addition to describing data, drawing inferences, uh, statistical methods can also be used for raising new questions in sociology. And of course, you are all familiar that whenever the issue of prediction comes, predicting population of India, predicting urbanization, predicting uh, per capita income of India 20 years from now, 50 years from now, uh, they are also statistical methods are of great help. And finally, statistical methods have been used in monitoring and evaluation of development policies uh, run by various governments and NGOs. Thank you very much.